This lecture talks about controlling bacterial growth, and it's an introduction to disinfectants. So historically, controlling microorganisms and the spread of infectious disease has always been an issue. Hopefully you got a chance to watch the video that had to do with what this thing is and the plague. And talking more about the plague is going to be important as we go through the rest of the semester. And here's the current hazmat suits. So these are supposed to prevent um, the people wearing them from getting infectious diseases. A patient is prepped for abdominal surgery. An antiseptic is rubbed on their skin to clean it. The surgical room has been disinfected. The surgical instruments have been sterilized. What was used to accomplish these tasks? What are some of the factors to consider when choosing a microbicide? Why is it important to use a different microbicide for different situations? These questions will be explored in this lecture, and then in lab we're going to explore the effects of different disinfectants and antiseptics on various species of microorganisms. So this is a picture of a vehicle, and it shows the most contaminated parts of the vehicle. And if you look at these numbers, the highest number is the center console, which a lot of things can get trapped in here. If you have children in your vehicle, then <laughs> you know that you could probably um, lose an entire bag of chips inside of your car, and that can be growing all sorts of stuff. So there's a lot of microorganisms everywhere in our environment. So historical methods to control microbial growth included salting food. If you add salt, or even adding sugar to food, that messes with the osmolarity of the solution, which can affect the microorganism's ability to grow in that solution. So a lot of times why we see canned fruits or vegetables have a lot of salt or a lot of sugar added to them. That's to prevent microbial growth inside of the can. Smoking. So smoking food can decrease microbial numbers, but it really doesn't kill everything. And smoking food is a dangerous way um, to cook, particularly pork, because of that pork tapeworm that we talked about earlier in the semester. Pickling food, drying, exposing it, or food, clothing, and bedding to sunlight. So UV radiation has the potential to kill many microorganisms. There's four main levels of control, so sterilization, disinfection, antisepsis, and decontamination or sanitization. Starting with sterilization. Sterilization is the complete elimination of all microorganisms and spores from a surface or from an inanimate object. So with sterilization, it kills everything, even endospores, which resist everything. So when we say something is sterile, not even endospores can be on that um, particular item. Disinfection. Disinfection is the elimination of most microorganisms on an inanimate object or on a surface, with the exception of endospores. So with disinfection, endospores are still found on the surface. Antisepsis is a decrease in the microbial numbers on living tissue. Decontamination or sanitization has to do with reducing microbial numbers to a public health standard. Usually these standards are set by either food processing plants or healthcare facilities, but they'll culture an environment and enumerate or get the number of how many microorganisms are growing on a particular surface. And then if that number happens to be higher than what is the standard, then you have to go back and disinfect again. So decontamination, you are decreasing microbial numbers down to an acceptable level. And what is acceptable is determined by the facility that is setting the standard. So microbial control methods, there's physical agents like heat, radiation. With heat, it can be dry or moist. And then um, incineration, dry oven, the steam under pressure like autoclave, boiling water, pasteurization, all that type of stuff. In addition to heat, cold can decrease the rate of multiplication, but usually cold doesn't kill microorganisms. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through here. And then there's radiation, so ionizing versus non-ionizing. 
With chemical agents, they can be gases or liquids, and then the different levels can exist. And the mechanical removal, so just physically removing the microorganisms, predominantly filtration, and you can filter the air or filter liquids. And then these are the written out definitions for the terms that I just went through. So when we talk about most resistant to disinfection or sterilization to least resistant. So most resistant would be prions. If you remember what a prion is, a prion is an infectious protein. So it's just a protein that's folded in a weird way and it self-amplifies, self so it can make copies of itself all by itself. And prions cause spongiform encephalopathies. In other words, holes in the brain tissue and nervous or um, spinal cord. So with prions, they are the most resistant. There's actually a recent case in a neurology wing where they had surgical instruments and they steam autoclave them, so they sterilize them in an autoclave. Standard procedure for cleaning surgical equipment. But because prions were in the brain tissue of the patient that was previously operated on, the prions did not get removed from the surface of those surgical instruments. So the very next patient that they used these surgical instruments on, about a month later, ended up dying of a spongiform encephalopathy. So they ended up actually getting the prion disease from the surgical instruments. So that's very important to make a note of, and now they take special precautions to make sure that that never happens again. The next most resistant form would be the bacterial endospores. If you remember what an endospore is, it's produced by some bacteria in response to nutrient deplete, depleting environment. So if all of the nutrients go away or all of the water goes away, then the endospore will be produced and these things are super resistant to a lot of different types of disinfectants. Then mycobacterium, which causes tuberculosis and leprosy, and then staph and pseudomonas. Then the protozoan cysts, protozoan trophozoites, gram-negative bacteria, fungi and fungal spores, the non-enveloped viruses, most gram-positive bacteria with the exception of this staph, and then enveloped viruses. So side versus static. Writing down the definitions of every single one of these terms probably isn't necessary, but you do need to know the difference between something that's a side versus something that's static. So if we say a bactericidal compound, side means to kill. So a bactericidal compound would kill bacteria. Knowing that side means to kill, I'm sure you can delineate the definition of fungicide. So fungicide kills fungi, viricide deactivates viruses, sporicide kills bacterial endospores, and a germicide or microbicide kills a broad range of different types of microorganisms. Stasis or static means to stand still. Homeostasis means the overall well-being of the body, everything's functioning properly, so um, there's no severe changes in one direction or the next. Everything has its checks and balances and so forth. So stasis or static in microorganisms has to do with a prevention of multiplication. So they're kind of frozen in their current state. They can't reproduce, so they can't make any more copies, but it doesn't necessarily kill the ones that are already in existence. So bacteriostatic would prevent bacterial replication, fungostatic would prevent fungal replication, and a microbostatic compound would prevent microbial um, replication of a wide variety of microorganisms. So practical concerns in microbial control. These are just some common sense things that you would think of before you decide how to attack a contaminated surface. So does the item in question require sterilization or is disinfection adequate? A hospital room. A hospital room can never become sterile. So sterilization means that every single microorganism in the entire environment has been eliminated. That would be impossible. 
air has microorganisms in it. Endospores are super resistant, so even if you sprayed the entire room with bleach, you wouldn't be able to kill all of the endospores. So sterilization of an entire hospital room is highly unlikely, if not like almost certainly impossible. But disinfection is adequate. You just take extra precautions to make sure it's disinfected to the best of your capability. Is the item to be reused or permanently discarded so you wouldn't try to sterilize a swab from a respiratory culture? It gets thrown out when you're done with it. If it will be reused, can the item withstand heat, pressure, radiation, or chemicals? So like catheters, for example. If you put a catheter inside of an autoclave, is that okay? Or will the catheter melt in the presence of all that pressurized heat? Is the control method suitable for a given application? Is it okay to use a gas sterilant next to a patient? No, because the gas sterilant would kill the patient. So again, some common sense things to think about. Will the agent penetrate to the necessary extent? This is one of the things with UV radiation. UV does a really good job at killing microorganisms that land directly in the line of its path. But if it casts a shadow, these waves don't necessarily bend into every crevice in a particular area. So will it penetrate to the necessary extent? UV will not go deep into bedding. So that may not be a way to be able to completely disinfect bedding. Is the method cost and labor efficient and it is, is it safe? So is it cost, gonna cost a million dollars to do or is it relatively inexpensive? So what is microbial death? You can't just look at a bacterial cell under the microscope and be like, oh, it's not moving, it must be dead. Bacterial death or death of microorganisms is harder to detect. They don't have conspicuous vital signs. Lethal agents do not alter the overt appearance of microbial cells. Now if we're talking about people cells under the microscope, our cells look different when they're dead. They usually have weak cell membranes and they'll absorb dye, so they turn like a bright blue color when you're looking at like a cell culture. But bacterial cells, they don't really change that much when they die, they just stop moving and the ion channels stop opening and closing. But ion channels opening and closing, that's not something we can visualize under a microscope. Loss of movement cannot be used to indicate death. Special qualifications are needed to define and delineate microbial death. 